Turn your Bibles to Psalm 40. Psalm 40. We are continuing on our series entitled God's Hymnal. We are on message number 24 in our series, God's Hymnal through the Psalms. I am excited about this particular psalm. God worked in my heart this past week. And this was a message that I did preach before, but I felt the Lord wanted me to uh, redo it or re-preach it, but with a little bit different twist. And I trust it'll be an encouragement to you. Psalm 40, we're going to only look at the first 10 verses. The first 10 verses of Psalm 40. To the chief musician... The Psalm of David. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me, and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I were to declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin hast thou not required. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within mine heart. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we look into another psalm this afternoon, Lord, I ask that by your Holy Spirit, you would teach us the truth that you have for us. Lord, I pray that the truth from the psalm would change our lives. Lord, I pray that even decisions that would last for a lifetime even would be made. Lord, may it touch every heart Children, teenagers, young adults, middle age, and even seniors, I pray that you would speak to us. Open our eyes. Lord, I ask for the filling of the Holy Spirit. I look to you to help me declare this psalm and what it means and what it says. I can't do this, Lord, but you can through me, and I expect you to do the work. Help me, Lord, to be simple and not complicated. I pray that it would be understood. In Jesus' name, amen. The story is told of a rich man who had a conversation, a private conversation with his preacher. The rich man asked the question, Preacher, why is it everyone... Why is it that everyone is criticizing me for being miserly? In other words, being tight with his money. When everyone knows that I have made provision to leave everything, give it all to charity when I die. The preacher thought on this for a few seconds. And he told the rich man a story. The story goes like this, that there was a, in a farm, a pig, and 
he had a conversation with his best friend, the cow. And the pig was complaining to the cow about how unpopular he was. The pig said to the cow, quote, People are always talking about your gentleness and kindness. You give milk and cream, but I give even more. I give bacon and ham. I give bristles, and they even pickle my feet. Still, no one likes me. I'm just a pig. Why is this cow? The cow thought for a moment on this, too. And the cow said very, very wise words to the pig. He said, quote, Well, maybe it's because I give while I'm still living. End quote. It sounds like the pig only wanted to give when he was going to die. Instead of giving while he was still alive. The cow gave while she was still alive. And, it, and many Christians are like the pig. They wonder why no one is impacted for Christ by their lives. They wonder why no one um, is saved, no one gets saved, or their lives are transformed. And Christians... They're only willing to give everything when they die. They'll even say it in their will. I'll, I'll give my fortune to the church or to missions or any uh, Bible-based cause. But in Psalm 40, we're going to see that David didn't make that decision while giving his all when he's dead. He decided to give his all when he's alive. We're going to look at that in Psalm 40, and we're going to see the results of that choice. I want to share with you, this is the truth that I want to convey to you through this psalm. God will only bless and use living sacrifices, not dead ones. God will only bless and use living sacrifices, not dead ones. The title of my message is Humorous, but I think it's going to be memorable. Why wait to be bacon when you can give milk? Why wait to be bacon when you can give milk? God blesses and uses living sacrifices, not dead ones. Let's look through this psalm and figure out how David came to that conclusion, to that decision. It says, in verses 1 through 4, it explains what God did for David. What did God do for David? Let's read it together. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. Let's stop there for a second. He heard David's cry. Now, we are unsure. The, the, the psalm does not give any indication of what the situation that David was in. But we know that God heard David's plea for deliverance. He even says in verse 2, He brought me up also out of an horrible pit. So this was a, a very dire situation for David. God is the God who hears our cries and, and our calls for deliverance. We find in the scriptures very clearly that God hears our cries. Jeremiah 33, 3. God's telephone number, it's been called. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. You see, these verses, this verse teaches us that God promises to answer a call. So then... The question is, what is a call? To call on God is to cry on Him, expecting an answer. If you believe God answers cries, you need to believe that He will answer your cry. Call unto me, and I will answer thee. Think of this illustration. Imagine you were out on 
at Rockaway Beach or Jones Beach out in Long Island and you went too far into the water, you can't swim, what's the possibility that could happen? You could drown. So what are you likely going to do in that situation? Call for help. Call for help. Now what is that help to look like? What is it supposed to look like? It's going to look like a lifeguard. This call, when you're calling for help out on the beach, in the water, this is not what the call is saying. It's not saying, quote, this is the thinking, the thought that comes through it. I need you to save my life, but if it isn't your will, or if you can't, that's okay. That's not a call. A call expects deliverance, and it will not accept any other answer, any other result. If you are out in the water, you are expecting to be delivered. You're not going to take death for an answer. The call, a call, says, I need you right now to save me, and I'm expecting you to do so, otherwise I'm going to die. That is what the call that you're going to make out on the beach, out in the water, won't you? You're expecting the lifeguard to come. Well, this is the kind of cry that David had. He was expecting God to deliver him. Otherwise, he would be in trouble. The Bible gives us a very specific call that God will always answer. And if we believe him to do it, he will. And it's the call to be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13. That is the promise that I heard for the very first time when I first heard the gospel at a, at a, as a seven-year-old boy. I heard the promise. So you know what I did with the promise? I believed it. And someone explained the gospel to me after the message. And I believed the verse. And I acted on it. And Jesus saved me. Jesus heard my call for salvation. That's a call. You're expecting God to answer. You're not going to expect another answer. You're, not, you're going to expect Him to deliver. And perhaps some of you need to make that call this afternoon. You have never called upon the Lord Jesus to forgive your sin and to deliver you from the horrible pit the miry clay of sin we're going to look at that here in verse 2 he brought me up also out of a horrible pit out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings David compared his situation to a horrible pit Interesting, I found, the word pit here is the same word used to describe the pit that Joseph's brothers threw him into in Genesis 37. They threw him into a pit. So, if you were in a pit like Joseph, imagine yourself in a pit, what would it look like? Well, you would feel alone. I'm sure in a spiritual, in a pit, it would be dark. It would be dark. There would be no light in there. Very few people would know that you are in the pit. And sadly, very few people would care that you're in the pit. See, Joseph's brothers, they knew that he was in the pit, but they didn't care. They didn't care. Well, David was in a spiritual pit here. He may have felt alone. Do you feel alone? You may have friends, but you may still feel alone. Do you feel like no one cares? Do you feel like you have to live life on your own? 
David was in a dark pit. This spiritual pit, I'm sure, was very dark to him. He couldn't find any light for his path. Do you sense in your soul that, you, that life is dark? That there's no way for you to go? Do you sense that? I would not be surprised that there may be a few people here in this auditorium that feel that way. Very few people knew David was in the pit. And very few people cared. Very few people. Are you in a pit of sin? In a pit of addiction? In a pit of bondage? You seem so steeped into sin and you can't find a way to break out of it. You're in bondage to sin. You're a slave to sin. Do you feel that way? That's what life is like without Jesus Christ. You see, you see, just like we're alone in the pit, we're alone in our sin and we have no relationship with God. We don't know where we're headed. It's dark. We don't know the right way to go. And no one cares about our soul. Satan doesn't care about your soul if you're in sin. If you do not know Jesus, the devil does not care. He doesn't care. He wants you to stay in bondage to sin. He wants you to stay a slave. Do you see yourself in a spiritual pit like David is here? But I want to give you good news here. You do not have to stay there. David admitted that he was in a spiritual pit. He cried out to God, to the Lord who delivers. He expected deliverance from Almighty God. And what, is it what do we find here? He brought me up out of the pit, out of the miry clay. And not only that, he set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. He was on solid ground. He was no longer afraid of sinking. No longer afraid to be in a relationship with his God, in a secure standing. And he was able to walk back on the path that God had for him. My friend, when you call upon the Lord Jesus Christ because of what he, he accomplished for you on the cross, if you call out to him, he promises to deliver you out of your sin pit. And establish your path to put you on solid ground. You will have a right standing with your Heavenly Father. God will no longer see you in your sin. He will see you in His Son's righteousness. When you stand before God, and if He were to ask you, Why should I let you into heaven? He won't see your sin clothes. He'll see the righteousness of His Son. And if He sees the righteousness of His Son, He has to let you in. And that righteousness is not your righteousness. In other words, it's not the good deeds that you do. David knew he could not get himself out of this pit, no matter how hard he tried. Don't think that you can get yourself out of the pit either. Only the Lord Jesus can. And I challenge you, to today make the life-changing decision. And I promise you, it will change your life. When you admit to God that you are in the spiritual pit of sin, that you are a sinner, and you need His deliverance from hell, and you call out to Jesus to deliver you and forgive you because of His death and resurrection, He satisfied God's wrath for your soul, you call out to him. He promises to give you eternal life and forgive your sin. Do you see your need for him? If you cry to him, he'll do it. This is what also God did for David. He hath put a new song in my mouth. Verse 3.
There are some of you who did cry out to the Lord. You are a Christian. You are a believer. You remember the day that you asked Jesus to reign in your heart. You remember that. You're now walking on the solid ground. Are you glad for what he did for you? Is there a song in your soul that wants to sing praise to your Father? If there is a new song in your soul, can I say this? There must have been an old one. In other words, there must have been an old song, a song that you used to sing. I remember when I was a when I got saved at seven years old, there was some music that caught my attention. Before I got saved, there was music that I liked. Then I became a Christian. I got saved. And God put it on my heart to sing a different song. A different song. And I'm not talking about a song that's different simply because it has lyrics to a hymn. It's different. It's not like the world at all. And I'm so glad that Jesus taught me to sing the way he wants me to sing. The songs that he wants me to listen to because they glorify him. You see, since we're new creatures in Christ, you and I, if you're saved, you and I should no longer sing the songs that we used to sing before we got saved. No longer. Christians should not be singing or hearing ACDC, Marilyn Manson, or the groups like KISS, rock and roll groups that teach rebellion. They, their themes are actually satanic to the core. No Christian should ever be listening to that. Ephesians 5 verse 11 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. They're not healthy for your soul, Christian, for your walk with God. Pop music. People like Taylor Swift, Katy Perry, Lady Gaga, Justin Timberlake, to name a few. I could name many, many more artists that are out there. Christians should not be listening to them. And here's a little fact for you. Many of these people have given their soul to the devil. And when we listen to them, not only are we endorsing their satanic lifestyle, but we are imbibing the satanic thinking, the thinking of the world into our hearts, it will cause us to be in rebellion against God. Do not expect, do not expect your prayer life to grow if you're listening to, to that music. Do not expect to be winning people to Jesus Christ if you're going to be listening to that kind of music. Because you're not going to have the thinking or the heart to that loves the Lord, therefore you want to share with people the gospel. It's not going to work that way. Country music or contemporary Christian music, Christian lyrics with worldly music. Christian music with, with Christian words with worldly music is not new. That's not a new song. It's not. It's only Christianizing the old. I find it sad, and, and I'm pretty sure to Almighty God it is distasteful that we Christians, or there are Christian artists out there, that think it's okay to use the worldly music to praise Him. If there's music like that that you're listening to, I strongly encourage you to throw it away and see that God is displeased with it. 
There must be a new song in your heart, not an old one, not the same old song. You're a Christian, you're new, you're a new creature if you're saved. Put away the old and start singing the new song. Psalm 29 verse 2, give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Sing as if you were in the very presence of God. Would you bring rock and roll music to the presence of God? I don't think so. Or country music? Pop music? Do you think that would stand in heaven? Do you think the angels are using that? I don't think so. Now, David says here, Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust. My friend, if you called out to the Lord Jesus, like David did here, he called out to God in his pit. And if you have called Jesus to deliver you out of your pit of sin, you are blessed. He said, blessed is that man or that woman that maketh the Lord his trust. It's a blessed thing. To be delivered from the pit of sin and to be on solid ground walking in the path that he wants you to, to walk. Why did God do so much for David? Why did God do all this for him? Look at verse 5. And I trust this will be an encouragement to you. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to us, where they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I were to declare and speak of them, there are more than can be numbered. Let's start with this, the beginning of verse 5. Many, O Lord God, are thy wonderful works. The reason why God, number one, God did this for David is to demonstrate his power. David called God's works wonderful. Wonderful. The word here, wonderful, is the same root word that we find in Isaiah, in Isaiah 9, 6. And he shall be called wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And if you and I go through David's life, you'll find that God's works were wonderful. Or marvelous. Like anointing him to be the next king in 1 Samuel 16. You look in the next chapter, Goliath, this nine foot nine giant, who blasphemed Jehovah God, David, with a love and a passion for God, wanted to step to the plate, trusted the Lord to use him to free Israel from the Philistines. God did a mighty victory in seeing Goliath slain. In the end of his life, David confessed of God's deliverance from Saul's armies. You read that in the beginning of Psalm 18 and 2 Samuel 22, you'll find that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. God's deliverance. You see, God has also done marvelous works for his people in the past. Marvelous things. Exodus 3.19. It shares. It calls the plagues and the parting of the Red Sea. Marvelous. These were marvelous works. Hannah, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, gives praise to God for her deliverance. By God giving her Samuel. Christ himself did wonderful works in his day. Matthew 21, 14 and 15. The Bible says that he did marvelous works. Healing people. Delivering them from life-threatening illness and disease. Delivering them from satanic possession. He set people free. He forgave the most vile sinners. He forgave the woman in adultery. 
he forgave the man that was lame he couldn't walk he said son thy sins be forgiven thee and not only did God want to show his power to David he wanted to show his love to David he said David I think about you so much it says here thy thoughts which are to us were many are your thoughts to us were they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee and I love the fact that he used the word us he didn't say me he said us you know what that means God thinks about you too he thinks about you a lot a lot think about this Psalm 139, verses 16 through 18, it says, Thine eyes, David said, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. You know what that means? God knew David and thought about David even before he was formed in the womb. And he continues on. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count the very thoughts you have for me, they are more in number than the sand. Wow. This was not because David had any goodness in himself that merited God's favor. God loved David before David ever loved God. My friend, God thinks about you. He loves you. With an everlasting love. I'll believe that. He really does. He understands the situation of life that you're in. If you see yourself as, still in that pit of sin, He thinks about you and He loves you. And He wants to deliver you. I can't say that enough. He wants to deliver you through His Son. Do you need deliverance from the pit of sin? Christian, is there a financial need that you have? Or is there a relationship that you need God to restore? Do you have a broken heart? Is your mind filled with guilt? God thinks about you. And he has thoughts of love to you. He loves you. He is the father in the parable that's at the door of his house waiting and longing for his son to return. He's waiting for you to return, Christian. If you're, if you're in sin, he's waiting for you to return. Come to the Lord. He will forgive. He will pardon. He will restore that relationship that you have with him. Now, what did David do for God? What did David do for him? You see, David shows his gratitude to God in verses 1 through 5. Now, verses 6 through 8 is the decision. This is the crux of my message, the, the, the crucial point of my message. And I, I ask for your intention. Sacrifice and offering, verse 6, thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burn offering and sin offering hast thou not required. God was not looking for a sacrifice here. David knew that. So he didn't give sacrifices, but this is what he did give. Let's look at verse 7. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God. You know what David gave? He gave his heart. He gave God his will. Instead of my will, Lord, thy will be done. I delight to do your will, Lord. Whatever your will is for me, I want to do it. Because you delivered me from the pit of sin. And I think in the, in the New Testament, we find a perfect verse. Perfect verse that explains it. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, Christian, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may approve what is that good 
and acceptable and perfect will of God. By the mercies of God, because of God's mercy to you in salvation, present your body a living sacrifice. That's why I said God blesses and uses living sacrifices, not dead ones. God's not waiting for you to die to give your all. He wants you to give your all now. Now. And it's reasonable. It's the right thing to do. It's the right thing. David here is not the only one who quoted these verses to say, I delight to do your will. David was here was not the only one. You see in verse 7, Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. Why did David say in the volume of the book it is written of me? I believe it's because he was writing a prophecy concerning someone who would one day Delight to do the will of God. This is a prophecy of someone in the future who would give this same prayer. Hold your finger in Psalm 40 and go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10. Verse 1, for the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. The law could not make any human being righteous before God. That's the point. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. Because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of all sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. The author of Hebrews is saying, in the Old Testament, they had to continually give sacrifices. And even though these sacrifices were continually being offered... They could not take away sins, verse 4. It only covered the sin. It, it covered the sin. It didn't take it away. But, verse 5, gives us a glimpse of a future sacrifice that would come. And it did come. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. In burnt sacrifice, offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Verse 7. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O God. Verse 5. Who is he? that came into the world? Jesus himself? These verses in Psalm 40 are a prophecy of the incarnation of the Son of God. Jesus said these verses, if you will, to God the Father when he came into the world. Do you know how humbling it was for God the Son to become a man? To put on human flesh and to dwell with sinful human beings like you and I? To redeem them who were under the law? This was God's will, the Father's will for His Son, and He said, I delight to do it. The point I want to say Jesus did not wait to give His all on the cross, He gave His all. When he came into the world. That's when he gave his all. His life was a sacrifice. A living sacrifice to God. And Christian. You must be a living sacrifice too. If Jesus was a living sacrifice. You must be as well. You must be as well. Jesus said. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. And to finish his work. 
And what was the result of David giving his all? You find in Psalm 40, if you want to turn back there really quickly, for sake of time, it says, I have preached righteousness in verse 9 in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained from my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. David was, he had a heart of praise. And with his heart, he told everyone of God's righteousness. He made sure no one did not know. Paul did the same thing in, Acts, in the book of Acts. He's free from the blood of all men. He said, I made sure everyone possible could tell, could hear of God's love for them. And undoubtedly, David, as he was giving God's faithfulness and truth and salvation, we find in these verses his loving kindness. He shared his testimony. No doubt, people trusted in the Lord too. They saw God's change in his life. And they got saved too. I close with this. Nicholas Zinzendorf was a young man. He's a German nobleman whose father died when he was an infant. Zinzendorf was raised by his mother, grandmother, and aunt. All three ladies were godly, godly Christians. When he became a teenager, he went to the University of Wittenberg. He graduated, and after his graduation, he decided to tour Europe, a grand tour of Europe. He came in one of his stops to Dusseldorf, Dusseldorf, Germany. In Germany, this little town was a art museum. And in this art museum was a painting, very famous painting, but one of them was very familiar, was caught Zinzendorf's eyes. An artist named Domenico Fetti, he painted Ecce Homo. In Latin that means behold the man. And this was a painting of the thorn-crowned Christ looking at the observer. So if you could picture Christ with the thorn crown, thorn crown of thorns on his head looking back at you. That's what Nicholas was looking at. On the bottom of the painting was a question in Latin. It said this, This have I done for thee. What have you done for me? Nicholas, as a teenager, read that and it captivated him. And that, at that moment, he surrendered to Christ. This is what he said. He said, quote, I have loved him for a long time, but I've never actually done anything for him. From now on, I will do whatever he leads me to do, end quote. And because of that decision to surrender to the Lord, history tells us that he was the leader of the Moravian missions movement in the 1720s. God mightily used him to lead other believers to go out all throughout the world to preach the gospel. Some of the Moravians came to the colonies. That is one reason why I believe the nation that we live in today has a Christian foundation because of these missionaries. Well, about 120, 30 years later, there was another young Christian that came to this very same museum that Zinzendorf went to. A 17-year-old lady Christian lady by the name of Frances Ridley Havergal. She is very famous hymn writer. She wrote, Like a river glorious is God's perfect peace. Who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the king? Very familiar hymns. She was looking at the very same painting that Zinzendorf looked at. A 17-year-old girl. And she read the same inscription on the bottom and from this moment came a hymn that she wrote it goes something like this I gave my life for thee my precious blood I shed that thou mightst ransom be and be quickened from the dead I gave I gave my life for thee what hast thou given for me my Father's house of light, my glory circled throne, I left 
poor earthly night, for wanderings sad and long. I left, I left it all for thee. Hast thou left all for me? I suffered much for thee, more than thy tongue can tell, a bitterous agony to rescue thee from hell. I've borne, I've borne it all for thee. What hast thou borne for me? And I have brought to thee down from my home above, salvation full and free, my pardon and my love. I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee. What hast thou brought to me? These are good questions to ask, Christian. He sacrificed his all, but he didn't wait until he died on the cross to give his all. He gave his all when he came into the world. David had that same heart. I delight to do thy will, O God. Christian, will you today delight to do God's will, whatever it is? It may be, it may be to give up sin. It may be to um, go to the mission field, go to full-time service. I don't know. And God may not tell you right now, but the decision that you do need to make is to be willing to do God's will, whatever it is, whatever it is. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that David said, I delight to do thy will, O God. And our Savior said the same words when he came into the world. When he became a man through the virgin birth, he yielded to the Father's will. And Lord, I ask that Christians in this room this afternoon would yield to that decision as well. Because you have delivered them from the horrible pit out of the miry clay and you set your, their feet on the rock and you established their bones. And Lord, if there's any that are in that pit of sin and they cannot get out, they do not know if they're forgiven, I pray, Lord, that they would call out to the Lord Jesus in his, in his mercy, in his love to rescue them from sin and forgive them and make them a new creature in Christ. Lord, thank you for Psalm 40. Bless this week. Use us, Lord, we pray. Help us to see people that are in need of deliverance from the pit. And give us boldness to share the good news that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.